So I wanted to start doing my serial killer videos again because I've taken a long, long break. Um, and I wanted to do it from this book. It's called A Killer Book of Serial Killers and it is so interesting. So this guy who wrote it, um, his name is Tom Philbin and he worked with Michael Philbin, their brothers. Um, they have researched these guys like extensively. Like I've researched them, but not as extensively, extensively as they have. And I love it. So we're gonna go off what they said. Now, this is in no way alphabetical. I was trying to go alphabetically. This is in no way alphabetical. Because it goes from Albert Fish to Bobby Joe Long to Ted Bundy to Dean Coral. Henry Lucas is in there somewhere with Otis Toole, Kenneth Bianchi, and Anthony Bino Jr. It's in no way alphabetical, okay? <laughs> but we'll be starting with Albert Fish. Now, they say Albert Fish. There, that's him. If you can't see that, sorry. It's not a very good picture. It's a 1928 picture. Actually, it's before 1928 because 1928, he was in his 60s, and that's when he's a young man, so. Not 1928. My bad. But they say that Albert Fish, if there's a superstar among serial killers, then it's Albert Fish. But if there's a superstar among detectives, it's Will King, who is the lead detective on this case. So. Let's transfer ourselves back to May of 1928 when this story takes place. So an ad appeared in the Saturday afternoon paper on May 27, 1928 that read like this. Young man, 18, wishes position in country, Edward Budd, 406 West 15th Street. So they gave the name, the age, and the address. There are three things that you don't usually put like online, but they put this in the paper. Now this is the 1920s. This is really the only way they had to communicate. They didn't have internet. But... They put that. The next day, there's an answer. So let me tell you about Edward Budd. Edward Budd, obviously, was 18. He lived with his parents, Albert and Delia Budd, and his little sister, Grace Budd, who was about 10 at this time. So they lived in a little basement apartment. And Albert and Delia thought, okay, if we get him work, then he can help support us. So when somebody came to the door, saying, I, I'm here in response to your ad, they were all for it. So, Delia Budd was home alone when, the, when she heard a knock on the door and she went and answered it. Framed in the doorway was a small man. And when they say small, they mean small. 5'5", five, five, 130 pounds. So, yeah. He was very well dressed in a three-piece navy blue suit. He had a blue shirt, a black belt hat, and polished black shoes. So he was very well dressed. But he also had white hair, watery blue eyes, and Delia guessed in his 60s. The only thing that Delia didn't like about his appearance was his teeth. They said there were some missing, some broken, and discolored, and Delia said they reminded her of animal teeth. But he identified himself as Frank Howard and said that he was a farmer in Farmingdale, Long Island, who had seen Edward's ad. And so he wanted to talk to Edward, this 18-year-old boy, about working on his farm. So now Delia was excited and invited him into the house because he told himself, I'm Frank Howard. I want your son Edward to come work at my farm. So when Edward came home a short while later, he expressed interest in working for this old man as well. And so, you know, he's like, business is picked up. I need somebody to come help me. I'm willing to pay $15 a week. Now that's a large sum at the time. $15 in 1928 goes a lot farther than $15 now. Nobody's going to work for $15 a week now. They're just not. So the Buds were very impressed with Howard and knew he was wealthy. So it was an awe-inspiring display to them when he pulled out a roll of money because they were living on the fiscal edge. They were very poor. They needed Edward to work to help them. So Howard offered Edward the job, and Edward's like, yes. But asked if there was another position on the farm for his friend, Willie Corman. And Frank Howard said yes. So he promised to return the following Saturday, this was a Sunday, following Saturday, and pick up the boys. So now, on the following Saturday, they waited patiently for him to arrive, and he never did. So Edward and Willie are waiting for Howard, and Frank Howard never shows up. So he sends him a telegram that says he unexpectedly had to go to New Jersey, but he promised to meet the buds on Sunday, the next day. So this time, he showed up at around 11 o'clock, so that was really early. They weren't, the, Edward and Millie weren't ready yet. 
So they wait in the living room for the boys to come in and 10 year old Grace Bud walks in. Now she was a thin sickly sort of child, but today, Sunday, she's looking her best. She had her on her white confirmation dress. She had been confirmed in the Catholic church just a couple weeks prior. Her soft dark brown hair was bobbed and her large blue eyes twinkled. I love how they go into so much detail. So Howard, Frank Howard gushed, said she was beautiful, just fawned over her basically. And she took to him walking over and sitting on his lap. So he engaged her in a game of counting his money. Now, her parents are in there. They're probably like, this is so great, you know? He had $91 on him at the time, which was an impressive amount then, because I mean, if $15 was like a lot, then 91, can you imagine how much 91 was in 1928? And then rewarded her for her counting ability and gave her half a dollar for some candy. So like 50 cents. So they had a few hours to leave before the farm and Howard asked Albert and Delia Budd if he could take Grace to his niece's birthday party. He said that it was at 137th and Columbus Avenue, that intersection. And now Delia resisted the idea at first, but Albert, her husband, championed it. He asked her how often does Grace get a chance to get away from this little basement apartment. So eventually Delia gave in. Delia gave in. Grace put on a great coat and left with Howard, who said he would have her back in a few hours when he came to pick up the boys. Now, Delia and Albert walked out with Frank Howard and Grace, and they watched as Grace and Howard walked away. Now, later, Delia Budd admitted to having almost a subconscious concern for her daughter as she watched them walk away, but I guess she suppressed it. Grace turned and yelled, yelled something when they were at the corner, but they could not hear what she said. And if only they had known one simple fact, Grace Bud would still be alive. There is no intersection of 137th Street and Columbus Avenue. Columbus Avenue ends on 105th Street. If they had known that, Grace Bud would not have died. Howard did not return with the little girl. At the appointed time, Willie and Edward are waiting and they don't know where he is. Now, they thought maybe they were in an accident, so they didn't contact the police until the next day when their daughter still had not returned home. Now, they had just formed the Missing Persons Bureau at the time, and so, you know, they, they aren't experts at this time, not yet, at least. So, you know, they're working tirelessly. So... To King, Will King, who became the lead detective on this case, there was little question that Grace Bud was dead. He was almost certain. Actually, he was absolutely certain that Grace Bud had died, that she had been killed. So it riled him that a man could walk off the street, walk in off the street, take a little girl, and then never return. They never saw him again. The Buds never saw Frank Howard or their daughter Grace again. So detectives spread out and talked to hundreds of people and nobody, nobody knew anything, which is kind of infuriating. I mean, Will King was following every case that came from ordinary people. People were calling in tips. Will King was following them all and they all ended up dead ends. You know? So weeks turned to months and then to years and still nothing. But not one single day had gone by that Will King had not chased down one leader or another, that he had not worked on this case. You know, Will King was desperate to find out who did this. So in early 1934, Will King, so this is six years, or almost six years after Grace Bud has gone missing, Will King collapsed. He had to stay in the hospital for three months, and the doctors told him before they discharged him, they were like, take it easy. But he had worked almost six years on this case. He needed to figure it out. I mean, he had been working night and day, and that's what caused him to collapse. He was just so exhausted and so broken down. So, he did not stop. He did not listen to the, to the doctors. He pursued every lead he got. Now, he told Albert and Delia Budd if you have a letter that looks like it could be about Grace, don't open it. 
And finally, in November of 1934, so it's been about three and a half years now, Edward Budd brought over a letter that had not been opened that was about Grace. Every single time he told Albert and Dilly, he's like, don't open them. And every single time they did. Now, when he opened the letter, when Will King opened the letter, he knew that this was the man who had sent the telegraph to the Buds in 1928. Now, this is what the letter read, in part. This is not the whole letter, this is part of the letter. On Sunday, June 3rd of 1928, I called in you at 406 West west 15th street grace sat in my lap and kissed me i made up my mind to eat her on the pretense of taking her to a party you said yes she could go i took her to an empty house in westchester that i had already picked out when we got there i told her to remain outside so he goes into the house she doesn't she picked wildflowers that's so sweet i went upstairs and stripped all of my clothes off i knew if i did not i would get blood on them when all was ready, I went to the window and called her. Then I hid in the closet until she was in the room. When she saw me all naked, she began to cry and tried to run downstairs. So she knew what was going on. She was terrified. I grabbed her and she said she would tell her mama. First, I stripped her naked. How she did kick, bite, and scratch. I choked her to death. Then cut her in small pieces so I could take my meat to my rooms, cook it, and eat it. How sweet and tender her little ass was, roasted in the oven. It took me nine days to eat her entire bodies. I did not fuck her, though I could have had I wished. She died a virgin. I would hope so she was ten. He did not rape her. He just killed her, cut her up, and ate her. Like, that's supposed to make them feel better. So, Will King did some excellent detective work. He realized it was a legal-sized envelope the letter came in. And it had the letters N-Y-P-C-B-A. Now that stood for New York Private Chauffeurs Benevolent Association. So he went there and he asked the employees. He said, hey, did anybody take these envelopes and maybe leave them somewhere, you know? And he's like, you know, there's, if you did, you're not going to be punished. You're not going to be arrested, nothing. And he was very vague about why he wanted to know. He didn't, like, go into detail. So... He waited in the president's office until a small red-haired man named Leo Sikorsky came in. Now, this is after seven hours of reading over the applications to make sure that none of the handwriting matched. So Leo Sikorsky came in and said, you know, I took some of the letters. I left them at, at a rooming house, 622 Lexington Avenue. That's where he had lived. He left them there. Now... Will King goes to that address, finds out nobody has rented that room since Leo Sikorsky moved out. So he went back to so Will King went back to Sikorsky and said that before 622 Lexington Avenue, he lived at 200 East 52nd Street, and he has some left some notes there on a shelf behind a bed. So King went there. It was a flop house. And this time he found something. He found some envelopes. So he spoke with the landlady and described Frank Howard. And she said, yes, that sounds like Albert Fish. Okay. He had been staying in number seven. So King looked at the signature on the register and realized that Albert Fish and Frank Howard had the same handwriting. So they were most likely the same person. Now... The woman didn't know where Fish was at the time, but she knew that he periodically returned to the flop house to pick up a check from the Civilian Cor Con Conservation Corps sent by his son, John. Okay. So, King set up a stakeout, taking a room at the top of the stairs that gave him a view of the intersection at 52nd and 3rd. So, 52nd, 52nd Street and 3rd Avenue. He smoked... He exercised, and he ate canned food, and he stayed awake for more than 20 hours a day, and fish did not show. Now, on December 2nd, 1934, King decided to take a break from his routine and went Christmas shopping. He was away for two hours, and as soon as he returned to his room, there was rapid fire knocking on his door. Rapid fire. 
Now, if I was taking somebody out, that would freak me out. I'd be like, oh my goodness, what happened? It was the landlady. Sorry. It was the landlady. Now she told him that Fish was back. He had come by a half hour ago and told him that, and she had told him that his check wasn't in, even though it was. And he was waiting, but she did not know how long he would wait. How much longer he, I mean, he'd already been there half an hour. Now King strapped on his 38 went to Fish's room. He knocked and the person inside invited him to come in. So he went in. Now inside, sitting on the bed was a man who perfectly fit the description. A little white haired, baggy eyed man with watery blue eyes. I have a fish. Now, King identified himself as a policeman and said he wanted to talk about some letters he had written and that fish had to accompany him to headquarters and fish agreed, went with him. Now, King brought him downstairs, and just as they were about to exit the building, Fish whirled around with straight razors in both hands. Now, King was able to subdue him and cuff him, but he had just gotten a glimpse of the real Albert Fish, a violent man. Now, Fish did speak at the police station, which is odd. Most serial killers will not talk. He said that after he killed Grace, he positioned her neck on a one-gallon paint pail and cut her head off, letting her blood drip into the pail. That's disgusting. Now, he tried to drink her blood when it was warm, but it caused him to vomit. Then, he used a knife and a cleaver to cut her in half at the belly button, or navel, and proceeded to cut her into pieces. So he cut her in half, and then, so he cut her head off, cut her in half, and then cut her into more pieces. Now, he planned on eating all of her except her head, her intestines, and her skeleton. So, he admitted that he ate Grace Bud over the nine days specified in the letter he wrote. He said the, that he was in a state of continual sexual excitement, and the memory of eating her during the day caused him to masturbate at night. That's kind of disgusting. Now, Fish led to the police to where Grace's murder had occurred. And he showed detectives where he buried the parts he didn't eat. So most likely her head, her intestines, and her skeleton. Now they found her head and various bones, but I'm not sure they found her intestines. Now Fish was eventually tried for the murder of Grace Bud in White Plains, New York. And after a nine-day trial in March of 1934... So, a little less than six years after this happened, six, twenty-eight, yeah, six, he was convicted and sentenced to death in the electric chair. Now, he described his upcoming death as the supreme thrill of his life, because apparently for a sadomasoch sadomasochist psychopath, the thought of being electrocuted is quite enticing. So basically, S&M. He, was in a, he was a psychopath into S&M. So, this is what Fish did. He engaged in coprography, which means he eased human waste, which is disgusting. He liked to stick needles into himself. Now, on one occasion, he tried to stick them into his manhood, but had to stop because it was too painful. However, when doctors took x-rays of fish at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, they had found numerous long pins that had been driven into his abdomen. Now, that's known as Picker Act. It's driving sharp objects into yourself or others for sexual gratification. That's where the s and kind of comes in. Now, fish was supposed to be electrocuted on January 16th of 1936. Three of his six children visited him. He had six children. Less than a year after his trial, Albert Fish had his last meal at 11 o'clock at night. His children were there when the switch was thrown, and it said that it took two, and it took two full jolts, jolts to kill him because all the needles and pins he had stuck into his body. It took two full jolts. It only takes one. Now, while King knew that Fish would roam the country as an internet house painter and kill other children, he never officially confessed to any killings except for the murder of Grace Bud, which was plenty enough to sentence him to death. Now, he was pretty much, Albert Fish was pretty much doomed to a life of crime and saved them from the start. 
He was born in 1870 in Washington, D.C., and when he was five years old, his 75-year-old father, no, okay, that means his father was 70 when he was born, his 75-year-old father died in New York's old Penn Station, leaving only his mother, who was only in her early 40s, she had a striking age difference from her husband, left her to take care of Albert. Now, Albert apparently was an only child. At least that's what it says. Now, she could hardly take care of herself, not to mention a child, so she had to place him into St. John, John's Orphanage in Washington, D.C. Now, when he was nine years old, so four years later, his mother was a little more stable and able to take care of him, so she took him back. However, the orphanage had been a training ground for fish in the perverse, sexually, and in every other way. And, of course, because of the psychological makeup, Fish was ready to use what he had learned. So, in the book, in his book Deranged, the author Harold Schechter lists the peculiar obsessions of Albert Fish. There are 15 of them, including a sexual preoccupation with one's own urine. I don't know how to say the word. And the only thing that seems to be missing from Fish's list of peculiar obsessions is bestiality. That is just one of the many murderers in this book. So, hopefully I can make these videos a little bit shorter. Uh, when we get to Henry Lucas and Otis Tool, you're going to want to buckle up and get some popcorn because it's pretty interesting and it's going to be a long one. Um, but yeah, that was my first video and I hope you enjoyed.